Speak to me, holy voice, let me hear only you. Guide my steps, holy voice, teach me how to undo. Yeah, for me, I'd been praying for help for a couple of years, actually. Praying to really slow down and slow down my life. And what launched me into my spiritual journey was actually having a crash where I had a sports accident and I broke both of my wrists and had a head injury. And that gave me permission to actually stop and slow down and let go of a lot of what was not serving in my life. So what fell away in that was friendships that were pretty superficial, based on sports, based on yeah, social life, keeping busy. Um, and that really was what I needed to have permission to slow down and really look at the fear that I'd been running away from for so long. And the blessing that came from having a head injury was that I had very little energy. And so I could only have a conversation for about 15 minutes before I would start feeling very tired and have to go and rest. And so for my family, they had to make really good use of their time with me. <laughs> uh, and my father was the type, he would get on his soapbox and he would just go on and on and on about what, you know, his beliefs about traffic or the government or, you know. And he would go, go on his loops and his cycles. And after a couple of minutes, actually, <laughs> I would be starting to fade out and just say, you know, Dad, you're going to have to stop. I can't listen to this. And so it was really great mind training for everyone to really start feeling into and thinking about what was, what did they really want to communicate about <laughs> and to really make good use of our precious time together before I would have to go and take a nap. So that was like an introduction to meaningful communication and purposeful use of time. And then I think your question is more about, as I was really devoting my life more and more to that, and then the Course in Miracles came in after I'd already started tuning into what was meaningful and purposeful and energized me, actually supported me, rather than what felt like a drain, which was just the typical egoic conversations. Um, and... Uh, Yeah, I'd only been studying the course for six months when I met David and it was very obvious that I was to come over to the States and uh, be at the Peace House. So again, it's almost as if my, um, my path and my stepping away from family and past relationships was just given in such a big way that I didn't have to stay in the same place and try to unwind. Um, I was sent over from New Zealand to America and I was there for six months. So it really gave me the space that I needed to totally immerse in the course and in a whole new way of life and in a purpose that was driven by guidance and not you know, past associations or family obligations in any way. And then when I went back to New Zealand um, to apply for a visa to return to the States, um, I went home and, and uh, joined with my family there and they were just going through their resistances and reactions to what I was doing. And my father had a lot of anger and fear and felt that he couldn't relate to me anymore. And uh, he just said, you know, and he would try to engage me in the old ways of relating and it was it was just nothing there there was not even an automatic response it was i was just blank it was like i just couldn't play the role that he wanted me to play and that was frightening to him he really was worried that he'd lost his daughter and my mother introduced me to the course and she was there but she fell into false empathy with him and also started getting angry and saying, you know, what are you doing? You're making your father angry. Can't you just speak normally? And uh, I prayed for a moment because I was willing <laughs> to do what was most helpful. 
And the response was, no, I'm really giving myself the opportunity to let the spirit put the words in my mouth. And I can be silent if that's what's most helpful right now, but I can't prejudge what I'm saying and try to say what's going to please and make my father feel comfortable. So I went into my room and spent quite a lot of time in my room over the next few days. And my younger brother was at home at the time going through a kind of emotional roller coaster with his girlfriend. And they were in this on again, off again relationship that was breaking up every day or so. And my parents were fully engaged in the drama of it and trying to help and getting nowhere. And then they came and knocked on my door and said, Kirsten, can you help us? You're the only one who's not caught up in this. Mm. And for me, it was, it was really powerful because it showed me that my willingness to follow the Spirit's guidance and not people please and not engage in the family expectations of me was the, truly the most helpful thing I could do because then they did need help from a perspective that wasn't engaged in it and I could actually help mm -hmm. in a true way and and support them to look at their own thoughts and pull their mind out of it as well <laughs> so but yeah there's been a lot of fear and anger and resistance at different times particularly from my father um, and I've just really used it for watching when to f see when I felt guilty or when I believed that I really was pulling love away from him and abandoning him and letting that come to the surface and being very prayerful about when to call, uh, making sure that it was only ever when it came from a clear prompt and not from guilt because if it came from guilt and wanting him to know that I loved him, it always turned out messy, you know, and it ended up with me feeling, you know, it was just a confirmation that I was, you know, hurting him or pulling love away from him. And, uh, and it was really beautiful how the spirit took me back to New Zealand, actually, um, every year for about three or four years to go and visit and see family and work with my mind and undo the specialness that was there because I wanted to just, it would have been easier just to not go back at all. And that's what I was praying for in one way, you know, can I just like leave that behind? But it was that I was to go and face the emotions and the attachment and, and work with it while I was there. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, there's still, I, I wouldn't say completely, I never say something's completely done because it's so deep and I've had that experience several times where I've said, oh yes, I'm done with specialness and then boom, there's another whole, you know, deep layer to go through. So I've really, I know that I've loosened a lot mm -hmm. and I've undone a lot mm -hmm. uh, and I'll see the next time I engage. But yeah, I don't feel a sense of longing or loss. Um, and the, the recent calls over the past year, um, I think I've had two phone calls and they were actually very joyful. Mm. Um, so that's a good sign. <laughs> Yeah, just a, cl a complete immersion in nothing else other than the course and traveling. Like David and I traveled so much during that six months um, that it was a complete undoing for me in so many ways of what I thought I knew, how I thought I could be helpful. A lot of undoing of pride, you know, of everything I thought could be, yeah, my contribution to awakening. Um, and I was opening up so rapidly and to hearing the spirit, um, I began journaling and just hearing the spirit so clearly in my mind, I could have any question answered. And so I was really tapping into this, this voice that didn't 
had nothing to do with you know the world and so the contrast of going back there where everything was coming from this perspective of fear and you know just the old ideas that there was just no meeting point in that mm. right and I couldn't let go of this to try to join in that and at the time I was still so new to mind training that I had to give myself full permission to be 100% devoted to this and like I would say now so much has been washed away that I can relate in a much easier way it's like my mind is a lot softer and um, a conversation would come where I wouldn't be judging it in my mind going okay that's not real that's an illusion that's meaningless you know I don't have that going on anymore there's more of like my mind is trained to listen for the truth right. and to connect with that and so I'm able to join in the love and the connection that's beyond the words mm. whereas at that time that's just where I was at and I had to go with it. Mm. I kind of describe that phase as a metaphysical Nazi <laughs> because you're, kind of, you're going through this like, oh my God, only the Course is true, you know, and only these words are true and I can't listen to anything else that's not true and it's quite unbearable to actually listen to meaningless talk. So that was the phase I was in when I first went back for the visit so it was probably pretty intense for them but I was also going through this I had no choice you know I really had to honor the process I was going through and mm. and not compromise in that yeah that's the training that's really what the training is is just to see when we do perceive someone as weak and just seeing, observing that and seeing that that must be a false perception and it's the ego's way of keeping us trapped in this belief that we have to stay to save the world and save people and we can't go to God that would be selfish right. and that would be abandoning yes. and leaving someone behind and that's like I think the core painful thought that everyone has to go through is in one way or another it's a, it's a form of that mm. I can't leave them behind and I love that it's like Matrix and uh, Neo in the Matrix where he has that point of decision it's like are you going to go to the source or are you going to go back into the Matrix to save Trinity and she's in trouble you know and and he's he, in the movie he just goes back into the Matrix he's like I can't leave her I can't go straight for the source and he wakes up on unconscious, <laughs> he turns up unconscious back in the matrix and then he's back into this whole drama for another whole movie. <laughs> and that's almost what it is that we have to see <clears throat> that God is calling and it is to let go of that belief that there's someone apart from our mind that could be left behind. I had some really powerful experiences with that. I, I remember one night it was um, waking up with this feeling of I have to call my dad and I was almost I was impelled to get out of bed and I just like jumped up and went straight to the Skype and I was feeling like I have to call him. Um, he, he's lonely. <laughs> And it was so strong and I just pulled back from it and, and felt, no, I'm, I can't call him based on this because I knew that if I did, he would reflect that to me. But it was so strong and I remember turning the computer on and it's like, I have to call him, I have to call him. And then just pulling back, no, not from this. And I, it was almost as if something was just overtaking me and making me do it. Mm. And then I just stopped and went inward and okay loneliness that's what's up who's lonely really and just went deeply into my mind with it and saw yep I mm. was feeling the sense of loneliness it was projected onto him I have to heal that by calling him to try to fix it yeah and experientially went into it like just sat and allowed the deep feeling to come up and wash through and 
it was very intense, just a deep sadness and a loss feeling and yeah, a feeling of of just aloneness and loneliness. And in my mind just I was just so willing to go in it and go through it and and then at some point it just completely released just like a wave of something that's just allowed to come up and move through. And then I could just feel this real sense of just openness and peace. And then I asked, should I call? It's like, no, there's no need. He's fine. <laughs> and I could go back to bed and, and be restful. So it's so important not to push it away. Mm. You know, there is a there is a deep belief in separation from God, mm. which is separation from love, mm. and that's what we're healing. And it just takes these forms on the surface. So if we keep buying into them and trying to heal it on the surface, it's just maintaining, maintaining it. But the willingness to just go in and see it where it really is and let it move through is how, how it's healed. You know, just my desire to hear and like the course since I opened it up I knew it was the absolute truth and I haven't doubted it not any little part of it and so when I came to that lesson that you can ask and you will hear the voice for God he will reply to you I was like okay <laughs> great so I just sat with a journal and I sat there and I had these questions and so I would just ask my question and expect a response and it came so there was just no doubt in my mind that it would come and when I first started journaling I would write with a pen it just seemed that was the way for me I didn't hear the voice separately it was more it just would sort of flow out of my pen mm. and I would write and write and write and write and and then I would go back and judge a lot of what was written and kind of scribble it out and Oh, was that really the spirit and you know go back and forth with it a bit but I, I could start to really feel the difference of when was it coming through a filter when was it just straight mm. from the spirit and just you know work with that more and more over I think it was a year or a couple of years and then it was just felt like that was done and I didn't feel to be writing it anymore it was more of the questions had, had all been answered So then it was more of a trusting what I was hearing or trusting what I was feeling. Mm. Yeah, I definitely went through that. There's just these different phases that we seem to go through. And the first, I call it the honeymoon phase, where you just first get into the course and it's all miracles and huge undoings and... You can talk about that and there's such a passion for talking about the metaphysics and yes. sharing your miracle stories. And then after a certain point, yeah, there's a, just a deeper, a next deeper step that comes. And it's, it's an undoing. Like a lot of the first phase is like a strengthening in the spirit mm -hmm. as well as like a, an adjustment of a thought system, you know, from fear, really shifting that around to more of a focus on the love and, and the, what is helpful for our mind. And then, yeah, those next phases are really undoing phases where we're peeling away the layers of defences and the self-concept, which has been a defence against the fear and the guilt that's underneath it. And so we're starting to allow that fear and the guilt to come up into awareness. And with that comes a lot of self-doubt, which also starts to just look back and judge you know, how, what I seem to be talking about, or <laughs> I thought I knew something, and yeah, so it's pretty intense when that happens, and, but I love that line in the course where Jesus says, you can't tell your advances from your retreats, <laughs> and I hung on to that, <laughs> you know, because it's true, it's like the deeper we go, it seems to be that we're going into the unknowing, and undoing the I know mind, where there was a sense of safety, and we thought we knew something, and it's really showing us the deeper we go that we really don't know anything. And we're becoming totally reliant on the spirit. But until the spirit becomes really strong and stable in our awareness, we're like letting go of a sense of safety in the world and we're not truly locked in yet 
to the sense of safety in the spirit. Mm. And that phase is very disorienting and can mm. be very scary. So that's where the mighty companions come in, where you just really join each other in such support. Mm. Like we're not alone, it's okay, you can have a meltdown day or a couple of days, you know, mm. and just know that you're okay and it's what what we're moving through. Mm. Yeah, well, I went from (laughs) mother-daughter to friends, Uh, and we, yeah, were very close friends from, I think, when I was about 20, Um, and then we were just on our different spiritual journeys, her perhaps more consciously than me. I was still in my 20s going through, you know, exploration of the world and going off backpacking and but still with a, so not consciously spiritual, but very open to deepening in my intuition and being guided by where I was to go. And then we would have these conversations, we would feel see that we were going through exactly the same learning at the same time. And uh, yeah, then hers seemed to be more of a definite conscious decision before me and she joined with a group and they were going through the power of now, Eckhart Tolle the power of now and then some other Jeshua material and then they come into the course together and they'd been studying the course for a year and then they reached a point where it felt really intellectual and so they needed more of an experience and that's when they found David on the internet and went, wow, this guy's living it, let's bring him over. And... Uh, so we'd been studying the course together for six months. And so she was still in the mother role there, supporting me, recovering from a head injury, and uh, watching her own attachment to me, recovering. And But it was also quite a beautiful time because I'd been so staunchly independent all my life, and I'd really refused a lot of help and support and been insistent on doing it all myself. So when I was incapacitated, she was able to spoon feed me and brush my hair and dress, help me dress, and do a lot of things that she really wanted to do when I was a child. (laughs) And for me, it was just a complete surrender and a a big undoing of, again, pride and my self-concept and allowing myself to be supported and nurtured. And... uh, and then from that point, then I just you know, was more strengthening and strengthening in the spirit. And so she'd always called me her angel and really felt that I'd come into this world to really support her somehow. She didn't really know the extent of it, but it seemed that once I got into the course and completely devoted my life to this, I just kind of zoomed off into, yeah, this is it, there's nothing else. And she was still a mother and a grandmother and a wife and so there was a time there where she'd gone as far as she could in her journey still maintaining those roles and we reached a point where we actually I couldn't relate to her anymore because I couldn't relate through those roles anymore Mm -hmm. and so we didn't speak for about a year and for me that was it really felt like I had to let go of her of who she was and it really was quite emotional for me and it felt like a death. It felt like I had to walk away from one that I deeply loved and I knew her potential, but until she made the decision for herself, I couldn't try to bring her along. So after about a year or a year and a half, she came over to the States and came to a devotional retreat, the first devotional retreat actually. (laughs) And I still couldn't really connect with her And I remember talking with David about that and saying, what is it? We've been so close for so long and now she's making the turn and she's really coming closer and why can't I join with her? Surely if we're both the same Christ, you know, that was my question. What's what's in the way of that? But then I could see there was still part of my mind that wanted to connect with her. It's like, why did I deeply want to connect with her more than anyone else? rather than just accepting what's given. And it turned out that she was to join with Jason, and Jason was to be in a teacher-student relationship with her at that time to help her walk through 
some major steps that she needed to take that I couldn't have supported her through. So she got very clear about what she was to do. It was about letting, you know, letting go of her marriage and stepping away from the roles, you know, grandmother and mother and eventually, you know, the house and the country and really launch. And it wasn't until after she had actually started taking those steps and was really deeply in it that suddenly, like, it was back and we were deeply joined, you know, more than ever before. So, and now it really feels, yeah, just like holy relationship. We're mighty companions with each other and um, she's like a supporting angel in the cast is what it feels like. Yeah, it's been beautiful to see how she's been just had so many ways that she can serve and step in and be fully joined with us from organizing retreats, hosting us, mm -hmm. offering transport, bringing us to a country, coming over here, stewarding, stepping into stewarding one of the um, support houses and then ending up basically like you are, <laughs> mm -hmm. traveling back and forth and pretty much living with us. Mm -hmm all year round and yeah it's not something that I could have planned or made happen in any way um, but it's a joy when it turns out that she's to be where we are mm. so. definitely mind training and forgiveness mm. I'd say healed me um, I could have maintained a brain damaged status for life and that was an option but I remember making the decision that that's not what I wanted <laughs> and uh, yeah so I used it I just used it when it when it first happened and I had you know the crash I had a migraine for 24 hours seven days a week so I was in a con in constant pain and as I rested and tuned in and listened more, um, then the, it just seemed to, the healing started. And even when I came over, when I first started studying the course, I could really only stay awake for a couple of hours at a time. Um, but I noticed the more I was just practicing with forgiveness and, and really devoting my mind only to what was helpful, then that was where the peace was and everything would relax. And it was, yeah, like a barometer for how I was feeling, like the headaches would increase mm. with tension and pressure and guilt. So I just used it to see where is my mind and my um, personality type has been what they call, I think, a type A personality, which is just push and work ethic and work hard. And... Um, I mean, it's the doer, I call it the doer. Everyone has to undo the doer to be done through by the spirit. Mm. But for me, it was just very, very strong. And I had a lot, it's a cover over guilt, of course. You know, if I like do everything perfectly, then, you know, I would, there's a belief in there that I would be innocent, you know, and, and feel safe and feel good. Mm. Um, So yeah, it was a barometer to watch when I was pushing myself, when I needed to rest. And I also reached a point with it where it was time to really let it go. So I'd been traveling with David for probably about six months or maybe longer, I don't know, maybe eight or ten months. And um, every afternoon I had to take a nap. When it got to two o'clock I would start to feel tired and I'd feel a migraine coming on. And so we would have to rest. And David was so beautiful. He knew that it was just where I was at. And so we would be on the road traveling. So we would factor it into the travel schedule that if we had to drive, we'd drive in the morning and get to someone's house so I could come in and say, Hi, I'm Kirsten, where's the bed? <laughs> I need to go and lie down and rest. And part of that was undoing a lot of people pleasing, you know, to really honor what I needed for myself. But after a certain point, it was. 
it was time to start loosening from this dependence on it. An experience I had more recently in Argentina with sickness was really powerful because I was down there um, in a teaching function and I had a group of students who were very devoted to coming, traveling two hours um, to come every about four nights a week to come for a session with me and I started to get flu symptoms and I um, ended up lying down feeling like I was dying my back was breaking I had all these like intense fevers and um, I had a Skype call with Jason and I had the video camera on and he said to me what's wrong what's going on and I, was, I said, oh, there's this flu going around, and it's a killer flu, and people are dying from it. And he was like, no, nah, that's not it. What is it? What's, what's going on? And he said, are you holding back in any way? And um, so I stopped for a moment, and I could see that I was, that I was, I was actually holding back from really speaking up from what I needed to be saying. And by doing that, I was playing weak, and refusing to let the spirit come through in a very clear, firm way for who I was working with. I had these judgments in my mind of like, no, they can't handle that. Mm. No, that's too firm. I want to be liked. I want to be loved. I can't say these words. So I was pulling back, pulling back, perceiving them as weak and not able to handle it and you know, weakening myself mm. by not letting the spirit be. And he said, that's it. And uh, I remember Lisa walking in the room and she took one look at me and she said, take up your bed and walk. <laughs> and I just went, what? That's so unfair. Like, look at me, I'm dying, I'm suffering here. I can't just get up. And so those were the first thoughts that I saw in my mind. And then I stopped and went, what do I want? Really? And I was like, of course I want to get up out of this bed and I want my mind to be able to overcome this entire situation. And so I did. I got up and Jason said, call your students and have them come tonight. I couldn't believe that that could happen. I could hardly walk. You know, I hadn't eaten for a couple of days. I was really shaky and weak. And he said, yeah, that's what you need to do. So I just joined my mind with that directive and trusted, okay, that's the spirit that I've been ignoring for the last week. And I... I'm going to give this my total faith. So I called uh, my friend Deanna, who I was staying with. I called her into the room and I said, Deanna, call everyone. We're having our session tonight. She said, oh, you can't do that. You're too sick. It's like, yeah, that's what we need to do. Go and call them. And just my willingness to line up with the direction of the spirit and be firm with her and say, yes, that's what needs to happen. It was almost like a wave of energy came back into my being. And... So then I just continued on and was just really clear with her and what needed to happen and I went into prayer that afternoon because a doctor had come and given me these strong antibiotics and was there saying, you know, you need to take the whole thing, people are dying from this, it's very serious. So I'd taken one of the antibiotics and so I went in with Jesus and I was praying and asking, you know, what am I to do here? Because I didn't really have faith in the medicine, but I didn't have enough faith in myself because I'd been weakening myself for the week. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't need to take the medication and you don't need to take medication anymore, actually. I'm going to be your, your guide when it comes to that from now on. And it was... Yeah, it was really... It was really powerful. And that night everyone came and we just sat and... And even though the body was kind of rugged up with some blankets and I was sipping on a warm drink, it's like I could feel the strength and this love and this energy was just right there. And I could feel that my eyes were just, you know, more like, look here, don't ignore the rest of it. This is going to maybe take a day or two to come back into a reflection of the mind. But my mind had resurrected. And, yeah just for the group too, it was really powerful to see that sickness really is a decision. I did it to myself. I chose weakness instead of being in my strength 
and I can choose again <laughs> and come straight back out of it. So, and then it was just guidance, like be gentle, what's most helpful in terms of, you know, the body. So I wasn't like ignoring it completely. There was still some magic, like warm drinks and cough lozenges and blankets and soup. So, mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, because they're a, they're a real experience of that is so much closer to who we truly are than anything else that can be experienced in this world. And so they just open your mind to this realization in a real true way that you can keep remembering and keep welcoming into awareness uh, that we are so much more and yeah, than what's usually experienced. Well, the ones I've had have been like they're very different, and you know you can experience all kinds of different mystical experiences. Um, but they, I would say, generally uh, the the general theme throughout all of them is that there's an, an awareness of vastness that you are so much greater and so much more and there's a, a deep feeling of of peace that's just pervading out through everything and that you can't really relate to this world at all and when you're in that experience that this world is kind of funny <laughs> uh, and and not re real <laughs> and not solid and you just you know, really see that um, so for some that I've had it's been a oneness experience with uh, really with my mind but that maybe that one that you read about in 2005 was we were visiting Regina actually Regina Dornakis and we'd been making CDs and having a lot of deep uh, conversations and discussions and and then I went to pick up my sandwich at the table and I just went to pick eat, to eat the sandwich and I became one with the sandwich <laughs> and, and everything was so bright like I'd never seen a tomato that was that red before or a lettuce that was that green everything was extremely vibrant and but I had no mouth to receive the sandwich I had no stomach to receive the sandwich so the idea of actually eating the sandwich I couldn't compute that at all <laughs> it made no sense at all so apparently my eyes went really big <laughs> and I just kind of put the sandwich down and I could feel a sense of self that went out and I could feel that it went way out through the doors and out through the world and didn't end uh, and, it, and I could still sit there and I could see I think Regina was in front of me and David was off to the side and and then David was just like nodding at me they, they, they knew like he knew immediately where my mind was at so it was very helpful just to have someone nodding saying yeah you're safe it's fine this is good <laughs> And yeah, so I just was there at the table and they continued doing what they were doing. And it was, yeah, really, really beautiful. And then at a certain point, it just seemed to just kind of disappear away. And I was just continued to be there. And then I just picked up my sandwich and continued on. <laughs> so, and then others, it's been more of a the world completely dissolving in light experience and uh, I remember having a bit of fear that with the first one um, but again someone was right there with me which was very very helpful we were sitting there was um, a little campfire and it would, we had a, a big gathering and um, everyone had gone inside it had started to lightly sprinkle with rain except for me and a friend Peter who was on the other side of this campfire and we sat there and we were just looking into each other's eyes and I could feel that something was going to happen and so we just stayed there and 
and then just everything in the peripheral vision just started disappearing into light and disappearing 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 and then it came all the way to him and he just disappeared as well into light until it was just like these I could feel it was his eyes which was beaming light just where kind of his body seemed to be or his being was and there was nothing else except for this light and we just stayed there and I stayed and at first I could feel some fear coming up like oh, oh but he was there loving me I could feel this love coming so he just stayed there for a long time I have no idea how long and then at a certain point the vision of the world perceptual world came back but I could still feel my mind was very expanded and unable to relate to anything so I just went and snuggled up I think David was doing a gathering at the time and I just went and kind of sat by him and he just looked at me again and <laughs> saw my eyes and went oh you're having one of those mystical moments <laughs> so, so it was just cool I could do was nod and just be there and uh yeah, it's like, a, I love, it's just such a reminder, like a real reminder of of the truth. And it just seems like everyone that I've had has just strengthened that reference point in my mind. There's a reference point that's not of this world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if I, it's like if I forget that, and go back out into the world, I have something very strong and awareness to remember and come back to again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's different for everyone um, in terms of what it might look like or whether it involves colours or sounds or um, the whatever the visual experience seems to be. But... Um, yeah, and it's, Jesus is really clear about in his teachings, like not to try to make that happen mm -hmm. and not to seek for it. Mm -hmm. And he actually says that psychic phenomena can become a distraction. And so it's more of when we just continue on with our purpose and doing what the Spirit would have us do and doing the mind training. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, it's just like the miracle, it's involuntary mm -hmm. and just can come can come upon us and yet it's also the desire for God like the, the awareness of God was lost to us it will be brought into us through our desire because it was lost through the desire for something else mm. so as we're strengthening in this desire for God then these experiences that are closer and closer in alignment with God or a reminder of God or a reflection of God will come into awareness because the, the I mean I feel like I kind of have them every day in a way just like an experience of um, of yeah of being who I am going beyond you know music can just bring it on for me I can just bring on this experience of vastness or getting into singing is a way that can just like bring this experience of mm -hmm being done through, which mm. is so strong, but just, right. um, but I remember one, I remember lying down and I'd had a powerful experience with a friend, um, with a painting, I wrote about that on the, the mailing list, and when she paints, she paints from the perspective of the universe, <laughs> and so she has this experience of being this vast being, and then in her awareness, there's like this little tear, her name is this little tear with a little paintbrush painting on the easel. Mm. And her paintings all have like some kind of backdrop, whether it's a flower or a Hawaiian island with a beach and an ocean scene. And somewhere within the painting, there's a portal to eternity, to a galaxy. Mm. And I was just looking at this painting of hers and... Uh, just uh, somehow I just really welcomed this experience and opened my mind and went into a vast feeling of a mystical experience and then I went and lay down and I remember just praying to God saying I I want to know you completely 
Mm. I want to feel you completely. And and somehow that experience went much deeper and I went into a mystical experience that went on for many, many hours, probably the longest time. And it was really, really fun because <laughs> I was lying down and um, and everyone else was joining for dinner, a group of maybe ten. And, uh, and I had this feeling that I was to go out and join with them, but I just didn't know how I was going to walk there or how I was going to talk or what to say. <laughs> but I just went out and sat there and then and David was there and Jason was there and they were just like, oh yeah, we can see what kind of state of mind you're in. And it was, I was this vast experience of self and all of them were like these adorable, beautiful characters that were sitting there at the table and everything they talked about, it was like this mind was just finding it so cute and so adorable. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> but they were talking about, I remember Jason was telling a story about, um, driving a car and when he was driving the car he went into this mystical experience where um, an hour or two passed before he came, kind of came back and realized and was consciously driving the car again and he said wow you know that's quite amazing that that the car got driven that time during that mystical experience when I wasn't doing it and in my mind from this perspective of the mind that is doing everything it was just so funny because it was like but you thought you were driving the car the rest of the time but you weren't driving it the rest of the time <laughs> 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 like really seeing that these people who think they're doing everything are not are really not there's just there's one mind right. and then there's just all the characters and what's playing out right. and how adorable it is to believe that you're actually personally in control of what you're doing So from that perspective, guidance doesn't mean anything. No. <laughs> I know all this pressure around guidance, like what is the guidance? Holy Spirit, guide me. Yeah, eventually it's like, well, who's guiding what? <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's really like a stepping stone to loosen the mind to that state. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's really important. Like, you can't skip over right. the need for the mind training and for tuning into the guidance because that is what's going to be directing us away from, you know, the old egoic patterns and ways of being that are totally entrenched in the world. So you can't go from that to, okay, I'm divine mind. I'm good. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a lot of attentiveness and training to come to that point where the spirit is so clear in mind at the end that you know more of the real loosening can begin the course is not for everyone and I think there's like different levels of readiness for mystical the mystical mind mm -hmm. and I think of Eckhart Tolle who seemed to have more of a spontaneous kind of awakening and then it was just there with him <clears throat> And, um, yeah, it is very individualized as to what the path is and what is really provided by the spirit, but definitely meditation and the stepping away from the thoughts and pulling back and practicing with that is, is essential. And for me, that's what the course has been. It's been a way of, you know, all of those first lessons is all about mind watching pulling away from those thoughts and letting them go by, seeing attack thoughts for what they are. And meditation was a very, very helpful first step for me. Um, and I learned a technique that I practiced with for 18 months and it was most pretty much all I was doing. That was after I'd had the head injury 
because my body was slowed down but my mind wasn't and so this technique was very very helpful and I had long mystical ex well I don't know if it was mystical experiences but I would drop very deeply into my mind into a vast experience of peace um, and the thoughts would keep coming and I would just use the meditation practice to dissolve it away and come back and the thoughts use the practice they dissolve away and come back but I wanted to get why were those thoughts still coming up like that was my question and that meditation practice didn't answer that question and I knew there must be something generating these repeating thoughts that kept coming up so I just started to feel like yeah there's another step for me there's some other way that I can get deeper down to to what is causing these thoughts to come up and then that's where the course just goes so deeply into let's look at the belief system of the ego and look at these ways that we're hooked in like false empathy I mean that's just the most awesome teaching in the world as far as as far as I'm concerned you know to really understand false empathy and how we're so addicted to saving people in the world and perceiving suffering and wanting to heal that I mean just to be tuned into that in itself you know undid so much in my mind in terms of patterns and ways of being which just loosened you know to be able to truly meditate and not have mm. you know, those past fears and doubts and thoughts coming up. I remember there's one guy in Colombia. We did this had this gathering at a coffee farm and he lived on the farm and um, and his whole life was about service and gratitude. He's always in gratitude for his life and what he was doing and what he was offered. And then once a week he would go from the farm just into the little town, which was like a couple of miles down the road, and get the farm produce and come back. And that was it. He didn't go anywhere else, and that's all he'd done his whole life. And some of the course students were like, well, does he need to study A Course in Miracles? <laughs> and the rest of the group were saying, no, <laughs> keep it away from him. You know, Like really the course is for, it came to psychologists who were highly educated and they really needed to undo a lot of education and have a strongly education-based framework that they could relate to, you know, with a mm -hmm. practical workbook in the middle of it and a manual and a text framework that they recognized um, to go through. But then there are others that it would just be a major distraction if he, you know, tried to put his mind into that. <laughs> you know? So it's like the spirit has got a plan with the tools you know, for everyone. Right. Well, the first thought that comes to my mind is the question of what is rich? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of answers it all. Because <laughs> divine providence is total trust in God. And when you have total trust in God, you experience being totally taken care of and it really doesn't have anything to do with the world it's a state of mind and and then as a bonus <laughs> like Jesus says you know when you put the kingdom of heaven first all things shall be added unto thee so everything you need will be provided for you for you to fulfill your function there's nothing there's that beautiful section in the Course, once you have accepted you know, his plan as the one function that you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. He will go before you, making straight your path <laughs> you know, and leaving in your way no obstacles you know, to buy your way. And that's been my experience, that if there's this one function we would fulfill, and it's about following the Spirit's plan and trusting completely in God, then everything we need is provided for us. Like He provides the means to fulfill the plan. You know, God, it's not like God would say, okay, here's the plan, go and fulfill it, you're on your own. It's like He's going to provide the means for that to be fulfilled. And it's more on a mind level than in form, but in form that it gets reflected too because the mind believes in form 
if we go back to the perspective of the mystical experience, you know, mm-hmm. it's like form is meaningless. But meanwhile, while you believe you're here, the form does have value and is needed to seem to operate and keep having this experience of being done through by the Spirit and being washed through. And the Holy Spirit knows that. So it is magic providing the form, but the Holy Spirit knows that magic is still needed. You know, while there's a belief in being a body, or still strengthening until that awareness of divine mind is, is total. So my experience of it has been one where the more mo- open my mind has become to not thinking that I know, the more open I am to the Spirit's plan. And then I can see you know, how things can be provided to support me. So it's been a process of shifting from my ideas of what I think I have and what I think I can do and what I think I need, which is pretty small, (laughs) to, okay, Holy Spirit, you know, what would you have me do and how's this going to happen? And then watching and being shown and being really open to the signs and the symbols and the prompts that come in to show me the way and then trusting in that. Yes, that's it. So, like one example is when I needed to leave the States back in whatever year that was, 2008 or 2009, and uh, my visa had come to an end and I didn't know where I was going to go. And so I just put it out on the, went into prayer first Mm -hmm. and uh, then put it, felt to put it out on our mailing list. Okay, I have to leave the United States now. I'm really open as to where I'm to go. And that was my way of saying to the Spirit, okay, you show me and make it obvious. And, and then it came in just very, very clearly from our friend Sarah in Ireland. And she wrote and she said, Kirsten, I feel you're to come to Ireland. I'm coming to the States. You can have my house. You can have my car. You can have my internet stick. Um, the house is yours. I'm sending you a one-way ticket <laughs> and I'll meet you here and pick you up from the airport and show you the house and, and then I'll leave you with it. So, you know, if I'd had my own ideas of, okay, I, well, where, where can I go back to? Right. Would have been the first limiting thought. Where feels safe? Where can I go? And it would have been somewhere where I've been before. You know, the past in some kind of form. And this was a way of saying... Okay, I have no idea, and I'm in total trust. Show me. And I went over there, and it was the most glorious experience of divine providence for me because it felt as if I was just being, just like out of the nest, off you go. Mm. And um, a retreat unfolded, and it turned out that there were a lot of people in Ireland who uh, were studying the course on their own and really wanted to go deeper and... I ended up being there for, I think, almost three months. And just one gathering after another unfolded. And I had a retreat there. People flew from other parts of Europe and the States and came and joined me. So it was just, it was miraculous. And everything was covered. Like my airfare, in terms of funds that I needed, that I needed, (laughs) in terms of funds for my stay and my airfare, everything was covered. Mm from the retreats that I held and it just showed me that when I was just willing to do it it all showed up and afterwards I'm like yeah of course you know, what was I thinking <laughs> yeah well I know a number of people who have just studied it on their own up to a certain point and um that's part of why we built the Mystical Mind Training Program. And it was to have a way to support others around the world who do feel on their own and don't have a strong sense of community. And so it's, a, it's just such a great tool. It's almost like taking some messengers of peace home with you and having them for a year, being engaged in a retreat for a year with 
you know, a lot of recommendations for <clears throat> movies to watch and you know, music to listen to and being able to tap into everything that has been incredibly helpful for me on my journey um, in a way and then there's a you know, we have a mind training partner system within it too where you buddy up with someone and um, join on a regular basis and through Skype or phone calls so I feel like that's part of the answer to that prayer. <laughs>